The following episode contains graphic depiction of a violent hate crime and may be harmful or traumatizing to some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. It was still dark out in the early morning hours on October 8th, 1998. Judy Shepard was asleep in her home in Saudi Arabia, where she had lived for the past five years with her husband, Dennis. The phone rang around 5 a.m. and woke Judy up. Every time the phone did ring, there was always a concern. I was like, please let Matt be okay. Please let Matt be okay. The mom of two boys assumed it was her older son, Matt, a 21-year-old college student at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. He had a habit of not considering the 10 hours between time zones when picking up the phone. Matt frequently called in the middle of the night because of the time difference. So that was not an unexpected call. But the call in the middle of the night was not for Matt this time. The call was from an ER doctor at Ivinson Memorial Hospital in Laramie. I got a call from the hospital saying that he had been injured, that there were no details. I think we just went to a car accident kind of scenario. Was this fatal? Is this like, is he not going to survive? And the doctor said, you just need to come home. Without hesitation, Judy immediately began making travel plans. It was a Thursday in Saudi, which is like Saturday in the States. Offices are closed. Their weekend is Thursday, Friday, not Saturday, Sunday. We had to get our passports back from the company office. We couldn't leave until that night. So it was a very long day and we couldn't really get updates from the hospital. So can you remember what you were experiencing and feeling when you have no contact on top of needing to wait until you can catch a flight? You go into this kind of mode of understanding that there is something really serious happening. If you let your mind go to certain places, you may not be able to come back. So I was very conscious of staying focused on the tasks at hand. I knew I couldn't fall apart right then and there. By this time, my little brother was in boarding school on his own in the States. So I didn't have to, you know, think about him yet. I just had to get ready to leave. And so I stayed very focused to allow myself to go into that rabbit hole of worry and concern. I just couldn't allow myself to do that. Judy and Dennis had over 20 hours of travel with plenty of time to think about their son and what they might be facing halfway across the world. By the time we got on the plane, it was midnight in Saudi. We had a six-hour flight to Amsterdam, a six-hour layover. Eight-hour flight to Minneapolis, a two-hour layover. Dennis and I are like, well, we don't know what we're going to encounter, but we think we should make some decisions now. This is a discussion the four of us had had that particular summer because of what had happened to James Burr Jr. in June of 98. Three white men in Jasper, Texas, beat an African-American man, James Burr Jr., and then chained him to the back of a pickup truck, stripped him from the bottom down, and dragged him several miles to his death. His dismembered body abandoned on a dirt road. All the conversations that come out of that discussion. We knew in a situation that Matt was like, no, I do not want to be on a machine forever. If I'm not going to come back as me, I don't want to be brought back. We all felt that way then. It was just a lot of thinking and a lot of talking. Judy and Dennis landed in Minneapolis to pick up their younger son, Logan, who was attending a boarding school in the Twin Cities. The three of them took their final flight together to Denver, still unaware of what was happening until they walked into the airport. As soon as we landed in Denver and the police escorted us off the airplane because the media was in the airport, it was like, oh my fucking God, what is going on here? A college student was brutally attacked near Laramie, Wyoming. And tied to a wooden fence by two men who met Shepard in a bar in Laramie. Barely alive tonight in a coma, brain damage, and on life support. His name is Matthew Shepard, targeted because he was openly gay. The press was everywhere. This is the first time we see newspapers, headlines, young gay college student attacked in Laramie, Wyoming, and we're like, what the heck? We had no idea what was going on. No idea. What Judy also didn't know is that the attack on her son, Matthew, known as Matt by family and friends, would become one of the most notorious anti-gay hate crimes in American history. From Cast Media, this is Media Circus, an inside look at private tragedy in the public eye. I take high-profile crimes you might think you know and connect you with the real people behind the media coverage to share their stories, in their own words, on their own terms. I'm Kim Goldman. Laramie, Wyoming, also known as Gem City of the Plains, is a vibrant college town with a population of around 27,000 back in 1998. It's home to the biggest university and the only public four-year college in the state, 
the University of Wyoming, where a young Matt Shepard took classes. I want to go back a little bit and learn about your family before we met you in 1998. My husband, Dennis, and I lived in Casper, Wyoming, and we had two boys, four years apart, Matt and his younger brother. Look, there's my brother. He's awesome. Say hi, Matt. No way. We were like every American family, Little League baseball, school, school plays, you know, everything that everybody experiences with their children. In 1993, Dennis took a job and moved the family to Saudi Arabia, their youngest son, Logan, in sixth grade, and Matt, a junior in high school. We joined Dennis in Saudi, and Matt had to go to a boarding school because there weren't any high schools for Westerners in Saudi, and he chose to go to a boarding school in Switzerland, just north of the Italian border. We all recognized that he had this chance to become worldly and see things and experience things that just not many people have that opportunity, especially if you're from Wyoming. In May of 1995, Matt moved back to the United States. Matt graduated high school, went to his freshman year in college in North Carolina. It was during his freshman year that Matt called his mom with some news. He came out to me when he was 18, and I think he told us because he had a boyfriend. I had always suspected he might be gay. But that was my first indication from him directly that he was. Did he or you have any fear around him being an outed gay man? The 90s were very scary. The AIDS pandemic was still raging and the comedians were all about making jokes about being gay. The problem with the old costume, not gay enough. (laughs) Popular media was sort of stereotyping them and there was a dramatic push from the evangelical Christian church to isolate the gay community and definitely keep them in second class citizen status. To be really honest, I was more worried about Matt's tendency to argue with everybody than I was about him being gay because he had no hesitation about sharing his opinions. And I just thought, well, someday that's going to get him into some trouble with somebody. I was more worried about that than him being gay. But it certainly was an added level of concern. Yes. After his freshman year in North Carolina, Matt moved west to Denver, Colorado. Was there a year, decided he wasn't really a city boy after all and went back to Laramie to finish his college education at the University of Wyoming, where Dennis and I had both received our bachelor's degrees. Back in Laramie, 21-year-old Matt resumed his studies in political science, foreign relations, and languages. Matt was active on campus. It's been said that he spent the evening of October 6, 1998, at a meeting of the school's LGBTQ student group, where they planned upcoming events for LGBTQ Awareness Week. At the University of Wyoming here in Laramie, students say while there is tolerance on campus to those who are different, it's another story off campus. After the meeting, Matt went to get a drink at Fireside Lounge, where he met two men at the bar. According to police, the two met Shepard in this Laramie bar, tricked him into believing they were gay too, then the three left together. Just after midnight, Matt was brutally struck in the head and face at least 18 times beaten with the butt of a pistol, burned with cigarette butts, and finally tied spread eagle to the fence, left to die. 18 hours later, a passing bicyclist summoned help after almost mistaking Shepard's bloody body for a scarecrow. Due to his extensive injuries, Matt was transferred from the local Laramie Hospital over state lines to a trauma center in Fort Collins, Colorado, where reporters had already begun to swarm. We're met there by security from the hospital, sneaking us into the back door because of the media waiting for us at the hospital. It was there that Judy was finally able to see her son. Do you remember walking into the room? That I remember very clearly. It could have been anybody, really. I mean, his head was completely encased in bandages, stitches all over his face, where he had been beaten with a pistol, tubes everywhere. His fingers were already curled in his comatose position. He was totally unaware. The only way we knew it was Matt, when we got closer, you could see chicken pox marks. You could see his braces clenched around his breathing tube. Matt's injuries included four skull fractures. His brain stem was crushed. It was devastating. It was just devastating. A parent's worst nightmare. But the doctor urged, for Matt's sake, the shepherds keep a positive attitude while around Matt and to leave any anger or fear at the door. We brought his favorite music with us to the room. I had my perfume that he had bought for me. His cologne, we made the room smell familiar. We talked hopefully, we told stories. Definitely not to communicate any kind of fear or anger for his well-being. Where do you and Dennis and Logan put your emotion if you can't bring it into the room? How did you manage that? 
We take it into the waiting room outside his room. We were expressing it to each other. We just couldn't express it to him. And Logan would even go in the room. He says, that is not how I want to remember my brother. While they kept vigil, the community prayed. The cruelty and hate that was inflicted on Matthew Shepard cries out to each one of us to examine our lives and to do it honestly. And the media continued their tireless search for the story. They kept trying to sneak up to the hospital floor. They had to put security to keep them off the elevator. They kept trying to lie to us about who they were. So the receptionist, the nurse's station where the calls were coming in, we had to create a password so we knew if it was family or not. I mean, there were like movie producers and writers. It was insanity. At this point, Judy, did you know exactly what had happened? To be really honest, all our thoughts were really focused on Matt. We knew by this time he just wasn't going to you know, come back. I just want to be with him as long as I can. On October 12, 1998, with his family by his side, 21-year-old Matt Shepard succumbed to his injuries. The victim of what many people say was a hate crime in Wyoming this morning has died. His parents were spared the painful decision of removing him from life support. They said that like the good, caring son that he was, he was able to remove from them the guilt or stress of having to make that decision. A hospital spokesman said Shepard's family is grateful for support from around the world. Matt's death was felt by millions of strangers, including celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres, who spoke at a vigil on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. I am so pissed off. I can't stop crying. For the Shepherds, the support was absolutely overwhelming. We had to issue tickets to the funeral so we would know family and friends in the church rather than just people who wanted to just come. The advantage that we had was that we did not have a residence anywhere. So they couldn't camp out on our front yard or ask our neighbors or any of that nonsense that's going on in your world, even when you had it happening to you. With their home thousands of miles away in Saudi Arabia, Judy and Dennis fought for privacy from the media and the masses while they made arrangements from a local Laramie hotel. Even then, they would come to the front desk of the hotel and ask for our room number and try to call us and ask for tickets to the funeral and just try to be very invasive. We got a request from CNN to televise the funeral. It was like, no, that is no. What we did allow was the radio station to broadcast it because the surrounding churches had also filled up with people. So we wanted them to be able to hear the service and outside the church as well in the blizzard, but we were not gonna let them televise it. We have made a concerted effort to make this solemn service accessible to you while still allowing us to pray for Matthew in peace. We held a press conference the day of the funeral to thank them for being respectful of us, which we found out later wasn't so much. I would like to thank the press for respecting our privacy in these very trying times. As soon as I started to cry, I could hear the camera going off and in my head I'm thinking, this is why they're here. They wanna see this broken family try to convey their feelings they really only care if it leads, it leads, right? You and I have this in common a little bit. I remember the press conference, the first time that we had met with the media, it was silent. And then as soon as I started crying, it's a click, 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 click. And you can almost hear the zooming in. Right. My respect for the press fell quite a few notches that day. What did you feel looking out and seeing all of the media as you're burying your son? And then you have that to contend with. When you are the object of their obsession, it feels wrong, it feels invasive, it's oppressive, it is repulsive. The need for knowledge overrides humanity. Do you know why the media descended upon this so quickly? Well, that's the billion dollar question, right? I don't know if it was the iconic location or the level of brutality or the fact that Matt was a blonde haired, blue eyed, 20 year old, handsome young man. Maybe the media was tired of Bill and Monica in the fall of 98. I don't know, but there was something about it that just spoke to the media. But it wasn't just the press and supporters who showed up to Matt's funeral. But we're not going to sanitize their lifestyle either. 
I remember there being some protests and some hateful activity happening around Matt's funeral. Can you share that? There was an organization called Westboro Baptist Church. They were just anti-gay everything. Fred Phelps, the founding pastor of a Kansas anti-gay hate group posing as a church and consisting of mostly family members, was known to lead protests at high-profile events and funerals. I mean, it's not okay to be gay. I mean, it's a soul-damning, nation-destroying lifestyle. They had these awful signs, and their children holding these signs was horrific. There was a veteran from Wyoming carrying a sign that says, Freedom is the freedom to hate. I think that's the one that stuck in my head the most. They showed up at the following trials as well. Yeah, we we made them famous. Speaking of the trials, it's important to me to focus on the impact Judy has made on the world since Matt's death and not spend too much time on the killers themselves. But I will tell you this, as Matt took his last breaths, his killers were in court charged with his murder. Two of the suspects arrested will now be charged with first degree murder. Their girlfriends charged as accessories. They found the two guys. They said they did it. There's no question. The first suspect who stood by and did nothing while Matt was being tortured was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences with no parole. He's not the one who did any of the evil to Matt. He did nothing to stop it, which is like in the eyes of the law equal. The other young man, he did everything. When he was found guilty, we knew they were going to come back with the death penalty. We all knew it. I kind of dreaded it, to be honest, because I knew that that would lead to mandatory appeals, more courtroom appearances, more press, and not in a good way. Always the possibility of a technicality, screwing things up. The defense team approached the prosecution for a deal. The same sentence. Two consecutive life sentences with no parole. The prosecution agreed. They're lost in the prison system forever. They're only in their 40s. They will be there forever unless some governor of Wyoming commutes a sentence to make them eligible for parole. I don't see that happening in my lifetime. I don't ever have to deal with them again. That would have created so many other stories. So for me, I'm okay. I just want to focus on the one moving forward where we can make a difference for Matt's friends. In the days and weeks that followed Matt's death, his story was everywhere. It wasn't just news about the gay community. It was mainstream media. They told the truth. As far as I can tell, they were empathetic, kind, honest. They didn't sensationalize it. They were careful about the language. We had nothing but respect for them at the time. But they were coached by a young woman named Kathy Renna, who was with GLAD, who was the national organization for monitoring the press. GLAD, originally called Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, was created in 1985 in response to what they called defamatory and sensationalized AIDS coverage. She was instrumental in communicating to them how they should talk about this. Here's Kathy in her 2014 TED Talk. His story is the story of so many of us in the LGBT community. And his story, for reasons that we'll talk about, is a story that actually got told to the extent that so many of you, even now, 15 years later, can raise your hands and know and understand. It didn't take Judy long to realize that the media could be a tool to make an impact far and wide. First, using her voice for parents affiliated with an organization called Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, better known now as PFLAG. When we were in the hospital, even, we began to get notes and messages from PFLAG parents asking us, as long as we had the media's attention, could we please explain how important it was to accept and love your child? Gay or not, they were still your children. Dennis and I and Matt's little brother, we would do all we could, as long as we had media attention, to focus on being an accepting family. That was sort of what drove us in the beginning, and then it just got more important. Did it ever feel like a burden to carry on the messages of others like that? Kind of. Not the burden to get the work done, but we were in a position where everybody wanted to share their stories with us. That's hard. I love them for it, and I respected them for it, but oh my gosh, that's hard. That's hard. Speaking up for parents was just the beginning. Soon, the self-proclaimed off-the-scales introvert found herself speaking wherever she could. I understood I needed to become more outspoken to communicate how wrong it was of the world to be treating the LGBTQ plus community in this way because they are just people. There is nobody in this country that doesn't know and love somebody who's gay. They just don't know that they know somebody who's gay. They are no different than anybody else other than who they love. And why do you care? Why do you care? It doesn't affect you at all. With Dennis back to work in Saudi Arabia and Logan back in school, Judy knew there was more work to be done. There was a gentleman at Matt's funeral who gave us his business card. And I said to Dennis, who does that at a funeral? 
And on the back of the card, it says, I donated $10,000 to the Human Rights Campaign in Matt's name. And so I contacted him to thank him for that. And then he said, if you have any interest in learning about the Human Rights Campaign, let me know and I will hook you up. It was like, okay, I think maybe I need to dip my toe in what it is I can do to help. I contacted them and said, I'm, I'm interested in finding out about what you do and how I can help. And then I contacted all the national organizations and offered my voice to them as well, knowing that I was in the press all the time, thinking I can elevate their story, maybe. So I went with the human rights campaign and my energy was towards legislation. I was available to everybody else, but my passion was going to be in this direction. Just weeks after Matt's death, the Matthew Shepard Foundation was established to fight for equal rights. What was the purpose in your daily work at that point with the foundation? I wanted to get a curriculum into schools that wanted to talk about the gay community, share gay history, thinking maybe if people understood gay folks had been here forever and how critical they were in history, that maybe the prejudice would dissipate. My ultimate goal was just let them be them. Don't hassle them at work. Don't hassle them when they want to get married or buy property or buy a house or rent or have a business, for God's sake. Just let them be them and quit taking stuff away from them because they happen to be gay. They didn't choose to do that. It's who they are. Judy's goals also included a grassroots effort to change hate crime laws. When I got into this work, it, it was like, we have five things we're going to do. And we're going to do them in order. First is hate crime, because that's going to be the easiest. No, it isn't. Judy's work sparked national debate, including in her own backyard. Wyoming is one of 10 states that does not have a hate crime law. And the governor says he's still not convinced the state needs one. We shouldn't be running off as a lynch mob might, trying to look for vigilante justice, because that would be just as wrong. The movement had been in the works for several years before Matt was killed to expand the hate crime laws that were created in the civil rights era in the 60s because it just didn't cover enough. But every time they would introduce legislation to also cover the gay community, Congress would be like, no, we will do whatever you want, but not for the gay community because it was a choice. You can choose to be gay, like whatever. When Matt was killed, they think they realized that now they had the national attention that maybe this could create an understanding that the gay community should be included. President Clinton was on board. Crimes of hate and crimes of violence cannot be tolerated in our country. There is something we can do about this. Congress needs to pass our tough hate crimes legislation. The fight took 10 years and the support of two presidents, but eventually there was progress. In 2009, alongside President Obama, Judy, Dennis, and the family of James Byrd Jr. witnessed history. Do you remember when you got the call that the Crime Prevention Act in memory of your son and James Byrd was being signed by President Obama? Yeah, it was great. I was there actually when it passed. I was in Congress when they was in the gallery. Uh, this afternoon, I signed into law the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. It was just, it was just so amazing. There was going to be a reception at the White House. There are lots of really critical people in the movement. It was a glorious day. It was just glorious. But don't think for a second, this is the end for Judy. The emails we were getting now are like, well, now the hate crimes bill's passed, so like, are you done? It's like, hell no, we're not done. There's so much more to do, and now I'm really motivated to get it done. The momentum was real for the LGBTQ community. People seemed more accepting. There was more representation in TV and film. Oops, I did it again. I played with your heart. Will and Grace did a huge amount to just let people into their living rooms. Yes, there were stereotypes, but people invited them into their homes every week. Everything sort of began to change. People just began to pay more attention. But that progress hit a roadblock a few years later. We so earnestly thought that everything would continue down the right road and everything would be achieved but somebody else got elected in 2016. It just went south in a hurry. President Trump issuing a brand new ban, this time on transgender people in the military. We knew what was gonna happen in the next four years. The government-wide directive could have an impact on policy decisions ranging from birth control to LGBT rights. Women's rights, gay rights, marginalized communities, everything was just gonna go right back to where we had been years ago. It all went to hell. How do you keep your momentum forward we now have the advantage of people being out for a decade or more publicly, people being married, creating families, existing laws in states, not all the states, but some, 
And there were people who supported the community that were going to keep fighting the fight to move forward. Were you fearful at any point? I was definitely worried about members of the community feeling like they were free to be themselves and encountering someone who didn't think that that was a good thing. How do you tell them, be okay with who you are? Do you have firsthand knowledge that the world is not accepting? How do you do that? In my heart, I believe it. They are okay. They will be okay. But the first step in that is they have to believe in themselves. They cannot pay attention to that bullshit rhetoric happening around them, that they are who they are meant to be and to embrace it. Do you think that the media accurately portrays what's actually going on in terms of... <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> no, they do not. They do not. But if you want to talk about the progress of the gay community legislatively or social acceptance, the places that create the news live in the world where things are okay. New York, California, where all the rights exist. They don't live in Wyoming or Alabama or Mississippi where they are constantly castigated. That, that is not what you see in the media. You see the big city news, but the population at large is not aware of everything being denied or the violence against the gay community. After Matt was murdered, his parents were concerned that any burial ground in Wyoming might be vandalized. So they brought his ashes home. 20 years later, Matt was moved to a new resting place in Washington, D.C. When the National Cathedral offered recently to inter his ashes, his parents say it felt right. When we had Matt interred in the National Cathedral, that was like the highlight of everything. And Matt, welcome home. We do something now at the cathedral on his birthday to raise awareness about the community within the Episcopal Church and hopefully remind other churches that they should be as accepting as that church. But most of all, remind them that we're not done. There's still so much that needs to be done. So while you're out there kicking ass, how do you take care of Judy? So my friends here where I live are like, there's Judy A, who's the Judy we know, and then there's the Judy B when you're not here. We don't know her. I have a Mahjong group here in Casper that I adore, and we play Mahjong whenever we're all in town. I love to read. TV and movies are my sanctuary. I don't have to be with people I don't want to be with. I grew up where nobody lives, so I'm uncomfortable in crowds. I know how to take care of myself because um, I'm an introvert, and I think they're better at it than extroverts. You know, we often hear about families' marriages specifically when there's been tragedy and trauma. How have you guys managed to stay together after all these years? Well, yeah, we survived it. For one thing, we all knew that all of us had left Matt in a good place. So there was no blame attached that we had done to ourselves, like, oh, I wish I'd said I love you. We had done that, all of us. But we also weren't together. We all grieved in our own way. There was nobody saying, you should be over that by now, or I don't understand why you're reacting that way. We all had support systems where we were. Grieving is such a personal, individual thing that even married couples don't grieve in the same way. I really think that's why they don't survive, is they cannot empathize or understand how the other person is grieving or how long it takes. I still cry at the drop of a hat. I'm never going to get over it. I was really more concerned about Logan than anybody else because he was only 17. And I still watch for signs of something not being right. There were just things in our particular situation that were unique. And now we do the work together, which is also good. Do you ever worry that Logan maybe didn't come into his own the way he would have? Yes, that was and is a concern that Matt would have overshadowed whatever he might have become. Uh, that will always be there. I think you worry about your kids ever becoming in their full potential. Don't get me wrong, he's an amazing young man, super smart, kind, loving, brilliant young man in his own right. Just not sure that he wouldn't have chosen a different path had not we lost Matt the way we did. I don't know. We'll never know. We just have to accept it for what it is. I think sometimes in the quiet of my mind, um, and I've battled this for years, that I was Ron's sister, Fred's daughter. I never became Kim. You know, I was 22. I just couldn't figure out who I was in all of this. And then that pull to be the voice and then the wanting to just say, screw it, I don't have it in me today. Do you feel that at all? Oh, yeah. I feel it for myself because as a woman, I think that we feel that more than men do just because the opportunities were not given. Yeah, I, I never would have been this ever, ever, ever had we not lost Matt the way we did. I would have been the P-flag mom making cookies in the kitchen, not this person. Do you have a, a memory of a moment or the moment that you knew that what you were doing was making a difference? Something that you're like, damn, this is where I belong? Oh, yeah. I think it must have been the first time I was approached at an after-college program. 
a young a lady came up to me and thanked me for telling my story because her brother had considered suicide before that. Uh, and she thought that because I had told him he was okay, that it was okay to be gay, that it's who you are, that he didn't. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. And there have been many of those. Many. Because, because they so desperately want a mom to tell them they're okay. <laughs> It's pretty incredible what victims and survivors do in the face of our trauma. And I think you're a shining example of how to move forward in our grief to make a difference. Matt Shepard has been gone longer than he was here on earth, but his legacy continues on. You know, and he'd just smile at everybody. He just made you feel great. And Matthew was always the life of the party. The Laramie Project is a play that premiered in February 2000, centering around the reaction to Matt's brutal murder. For years, it was the second most produced play in the country by high schools and community theater. So this theater group called Tectonic from New York went to Laramie in the aftermath of Matt's murder in 98 and interviewed hundreds of people in Laramie about how they felt and they condensed it into a play. So the play is actually these folks' actual words. No sensationalizing, no dramatization. This is actually the conversations. It's been produced all over the world. It's been done in Uganda, in Nepal, in Kenya, everywhere you can imagine. But to me, the main point of the story is, if you take out Matt and his sexuality and insert someone and their race, it's exactly the same story. It's a story about discrimination and hate and violence. What do you want the life and legacy of Matt to be? That's an excellent question. And I'm not really sure I have an answer. I want people to remember Matt's story because Matt was just a college student trying to live his life and it was taken from him just because of who he was. I want them to remember that story. But I also want them to remember that Matt was a human being. He was a person with family and friends and foibles and flaws. He was argumentative and annoying and we loved him even then. He wasn't perfect, no child is. I wouldn't want my life as a 21-year-old college student to be memorialized, right? I wouldn't want that. He was a person and so was every victim of a hate crime. Matt played a role in raising awareness. He didn't knowingly give his life for that. He just was living his life. And her message for other parents who may have an LGBTQ child. If you were at all questioning that anything you did or the media or storybooks or movies or TV shows that they watch has made them gay, rethink that, please. It's who they are. And the storybooks and the movies only give them the language to talk about it and to feel good about themselves and understand that there's nothing wrong with them. They need your support and they need you to stand up for them. Judy and I connected as crime victims and advocates, but being a mom myself, the pain of losing her son resonates with me on such a profound level. But I'm so moved, inspired, and hopeful that the work Judy continues to do will create a lasting impact for years and generations to come. Judy, thank you from the bottom of my heart. To follow Judy's work and support the Matthew Shepard Foundation, visit matthewshepard.org. And I'll link to any organizations mentioned in this episode in the show notes. Media Circus is a cast original podcast, executive produced and hosted by me, Kim Goldman. Produced by Jackie McDougall. Harper Carlton is our associate producer.